In the tabloids and in graffiti on the Brooklyn waterfront, there was an ominous message. Where is Pete Panto? Concerning the fate of the popular longshoreman and activist, Pete Panto, his friends feared the worst. You don't openly defy the waterfront powers and get away with it. New York Harbor in the 1930s was America's postcard to the world, streaked with ships, spiked with piers, bejeweled with bridges, and studded with American symbolism. Chelsea Pier, where the great transatlantic ocean liners docked, Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty, and it had the muscle to go with the image. If you take it all, all of the docks, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Staten Island, Jersey, it amounts to 700 miles of docks, about 2,000 piers in all. And during these years, the 30s, the 40s, something like a quarter of all the American import-export business is flowing through the port of New York. But the Great Harbor, with its Sentinel of Liberty, was also a bog of corruption. A criminal alliance ruled the docks, comprised of the mob, the ship owners, City Hall, and ILA President Joe Ryan. He was called King Joe on the waterfront, or nickel and dime Ryan, for the miserly way he doled out contract concessions to longshoremen. As the story goes, the shipping bosses would ask Ryan what he needed to keep the boys in line. Ryan would answer, if they won't take a nickel, Give him a dime. It worked. There had been no strikes on the New York waterfront since the end of World War I. Ryan was told by his masters that they didn't want any strikes, and so remarkably, for a quarter century, from the end of the First War to the end of the Second World War, there were no strikes on the New York waterfront because the powers that be didn't want them. Unlike his West Coast counterpart, Harry Bridges, Ryan lived the high life. He wore expensive suits, belonged to several country clubs, and threw lavish dinner parties that became famous both for who was there and who was not. Rank-and-file longshoremen were conspicuously absent, though they had been leaned on to buy expensive tickets for the dinners. Only the chosen few made it to King Joe's table. People who were invited to those dinners was a who's who amongst the underworld, but also the political establishment of New York City, but also of New York State. And in, in a sense, that showed you the reach uh, that Joe Ryan had. Among the underworld's who's who was Albert Anastasia. Anastasia had penetrating eyes and a long history of mayhem on the waterfront. Back in 1921, Anastasia had been sentenced to the chair for murdering a longshoreman. But when the witnesses mysteriously changed their stories, Anastasia managed to walk free. By the late 30s, Anastasia had muscled his way to the top of Brooklyn's Mangano crime family. Fellow mobsters called him the Mad Hatter. Albert was the toughest and the craziest. He had a reputation for just flaring violence out of nowhere, killing a man for no good reason. That was his solution to any problem. Clip him, clip him. So that gave him great power, great deference, because he was known to be crazy and a killer. Under Anastasia's orders, Joe Ryan hired men with criminal records to work on the New York docks, just giving the boys a second chance, as Ryan would say. Except that in many cases, these ex-cons were mafia soldiers whose job it was to steal whatever they could haul off the docks. In a sense, it was a form of taxation by the union officials and by the mobsters, which was generally accepted by the New York Shipping Association. The business was so lucrative then, and non-competitive, 
that the extra amounts of money they were paying in extortion to organized crime, in extortion to the unions, still allowed them to have an enormously profitable business. Anastasia's brother, Anthony, ran the Brooklyn locals of the Longshoremen's Union. His nickname, Tough Tony, came from his years in a ship's hold. Tough Tony was a longshoreman through and through. Tough Tony loved longshore work, the dead reckoning of how to load a ship, of where to place things so it was balanced right and you could get as much into the ship as possible. He actually worked on the docks and was a leader. I mean, if you looked at Tough Tony, you'd say, this man is a leader of men. Tough Tony ran his docks like an old-fashioned padrone from Sicily. Longshoremen would have to pay tribute, as much as 25% of their salary, or they would never be picked out of the shape up. There's even an interview, it, it, if it wasn't so sad, you know, it would be uh, hilarious of a longshoreman who says, well, in the morning uh, the union delegate came around and I gave him a kickback. And then in the afternoon another guy came around and I, he asked for another kickback. And I says, I couldn't give it to him. He says, after that I haven't worked for six weeks. And so it went on the New York waterfront. The mob controlled the rackets, while City Hall raked in the bribes and the votes, and King Joe and Tough Tony kept the longshoremen in line. This was the great cabal of power that Pete Panto took on in 1939. Panto was 38 years old, by all accounts, a refugee from Mussolini's Italy, like thousands of other Italians, he landed on the docks of Brooklyn. He carried 75-pound bags of coffee on his back until he was promoted to hiring boss. Having fled fascist Italy, the American underworld held few terrors for him. Panto began speaking out against the Anastasias and Ryans of the waterfront. As leader of a movement called the Rank and File Committee, Panto staged rallies at the entrances to the docks. In June 1939, 350 longshoremen were present for a panto speech. By the time of the next rally, on July 3rd, the number of defiant longshoremen had grown to 1,500. Panto was getting people's attention, all kinds of people. He was told to back off uh, by the mob in Brooklyn. But he ignored that, and he just carried on. Pano was a brave man. He knew the stakes. He knew how dangerous it was. He'd been warned. Albert Anastasia, the feared mad hatter of the Brooklyn docks, was telling him to stop doing it. And he kept doing it. On the evening of July 14, 1939, Panto returned from the docks to his rented room. As was his custom, he laid out his work clothes across his bed for the next morning. He then left for a meeting. He was uncharacteristically nervous, telling his fiancée's brother that he didn't trust the men he was meeting with. He also said that if he didn't return the next morning, they should call the police. Panto wasn't seen the next morning, or the next. His family called the police, who refused to investigate. Just another longshoreman who ran off with a woman was their story. On the docks, his position was immediately filled, and the new hiring boss refused to hire members of Panto's rank and file committee. That's when longshoremen began covering the waterfront with the graffiti, where is Pete Panto? It became the haunting mantra of the Brooklyn docks. But of course, as most of the longshoremen realized, uh, Pete Panto was gone. He was dead. When the story behind Panto's disappearance came out in March of 1940, it appeared that authorities had the Mad Hatter dead to rights. A gangster and former Murder Incorporated hitman named Abe Rellis began to sing to the police. He pinned 16 separate murders on Albert Anastasia, including that of Pete Panto. Panto's last meeting, according to Rellis, 
was with two men who offered him a bribe. When Panto refused the cash, his fate was sealed. The Mad Hatter himself allegedly gave the order to kill the longshoreman and dump his body in a New Jersey lime pit. Rellis even led police to the lime pit, where they found Panto's remains. What is remarkable is what happens in the next few days. D.A. O'Dwyer, he's the D.A. for Kings County, Brooklyn, meets with various longshore officials, Joe Ryan, Emil Camarda, the boss of the so-called Camarda locals in Brooklyn. And a few days later, the case is abruptly dropped. You had the perfect murder case. You had the murderer. You had the smoking gun. And nobody goes to trial. There was never a case brought to trial against Albert Anastasia. In November 1941, Abe Rellis reportedly fell from the window of his Coney Island Hotel, conveniently eliminating the principal witness against Albert Anastasia. Pete Panto had defied the waterfront powers and had paid the price. Murdered by gangsters, the crime covered up by politicians, his movement suppressed by the corrupt union. The fearlessness of the man, knowing the stakes, he worked on the docks. The day he was taken off and killed, he put in a day on the Moore McCormick docks. He's a hero. He must have been fearless. He knew the stakes and he kept doing it. Extraordinary. And so the message was clearly made to the longshoremen about if you decide to challenge us, this is what's going to happen. So it had a chilling effect for at least another six to seven years. The next time one man would take on the powers of the New York waterfront would be on celluloid. The reality and the controversy behind a Hollywood masterpiece when we return. We now return to the docks, trouble on the waterfront. On the hard scrabble roofs and docks of Hoboken, New Jersey, a drama plays out in stark black and white. Longshoreman against gangster, brother against brother, priest versus the corrupt union, in a battle for control of the New York waterfront. We got the fattest piers and the fattest harbor in the world. Everything moves in and out, we take our cut. The melodrama on the screen had deep roots in reality. The movie On the Waterfront is another effect of these investigations of waterfront conditions that are going on from the late 1940s on. The film is really a piece of sociology that results from that stirring up. And it's accurate as far as it goes. You see there the shape up at work and men who try to get work and if they won't kick back 10 or 20 or more percent of their wages, they won't get work. You see that. The story was based on a series of articles by New York Sun reporter Malcolm Johnson as adapted for the screen by novelist Bud Schulberg. Schulberg contributed his own first-hand research in the tenements and taverns of the Brooklyn waterfront. 
I saw the places that they lived and the kids and the overcrowding. And so the bar became their home. Deepening the realism of the film was the presence of real life gangsters who had dropped by to see the Hollywood version. On the shooting of the film, it was really fascinating because the mob was literally all around us. They really were like right there. And, and uh, they couldn't walk right in and be a part of the movie. They almost were. In a celebrated star turn, Marlon Brando plays Terry Malloy, a longshoreman and ex-prize fighter. Malloy falls in love with the sister of a longshoreman who had been murdered because he had testified against the mob. Later, Malloy himself agrees to testify, and the former boxer answers the bell one more time in a dockside fight with the gangster chieftain. Filming of On the Waterfront took place in 1953, with the thermometer hovering around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Director Elia Kazan despaired at the conditions until he saw the rushes and how the sullen weather contributed to the mood of the film and the intensity of his actors. Still, the producer of the film, Sam Spiegel, was so sure he had a bomb on his hands that he started withholding equipment. On the day a taxicab scene was to be filmed, a projector failed to arrive. This was needed to shine images of moving traffic around the stationary shell of the cab. A technician improvised with Venetian blinds rigged over the rear window and with moving spotlights. This crude stagecraft had the effect of focusing all the attention on the actors. You should have taken care of me just a little bit so I wouldn't have to take them dives for the short end money. Well, I had some bets down for you. You saw some money. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. On the Waterfront opened in April 1954. Despite the predictions of producer Spiegel, it was an instant and enduring hit. It went on to capture eight Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Screenplay for Bud Schulberg. Moviegoers and critics praised the movie for its social realism, yet most longshoremen disagreed. Their beef was that it had taken more than one heroic longshoreman to change the waterfront. In reality, it had taken thousands. I met Marlon Brando at an airport some years after the picture was made. And I went up to him and I congratulated him on his fight for the Native Indians, you know, which I really admired the man for, but I said, you really, you really did a number on a longshore man. What makes you think that one man is gonna save the waterfront? But he looked at me cockeyed and he walked away. When it came to cleaning up the waterfront, Hollywood was one thing, Brooklyn quite another. In reality, the process had begun a decade before the film was released and was triggered by a world war. Experienced longshoremen were a crucial link in the war effort. Trains and tanks needed to be shoehorned into Liberty ships along with millions of tons of rations and munitions. There were war heroes on stateside docks. Several longshoremen were decorated for bravery when they boarded burning ships to unload explosives. The demand for labor gave longshoremen a sudden edge. For once, there was more than enough work to go around without kicking back a quarter of your pay to dock bosses. And for the longshoremen who went off to fight, there was an even more profound change. People became more educated and they came back from World War II. A lot of the GIs wouldn't take any crap. You know, they were out fighting against the Nazis, you know, shooting people left and right, and they weren't gonna take any shit when they came back. And that was particularly on the west side of New York where uh, rank and file strikes broke out right and left after the war. Now 
Thousands of Union longshoremen who keep cargoes moving between ships and trucks at the port of New York go on strike in an organization rebellion. At the morning shape-up, reporting for daily assignments, disgruntled members of the International Association walk out in a wildcat strike. Part of their beef is that racketeers heavily influence union affairs. The post-war strikes were a wake-up call for shippers who had not suffered a work stoppage since 1919. And because they were wildcat strikes, unauthorized by the Longshore Union, they were also stinging blows to King Joe Ryan. The corrupt ILA president had sided with owners on the explosive issue of back pay. For decades, longshoremen had been cheated out of extra pay for overtime. Now it was time for the shippers to honor their debt. They point blank refused. And when Ryan threw his support to the ship owners, longshoremen finally rebelled. What it does to uh, the back pay issue is that it emboldens the men. They realize that they can take on Ryan and not end up in the river. Then came the quickies, spontaneous strikes that would suddenly shut down the New York docks. As shippers lost huge sums of money, King Joe lost more of his clout. Then there was journalist Malcolm Johnson and his groundbreaking exposés. Malcolm Johnson was a reporter for the New York Sun and he published a series of very fearless and accurate articles on waterfront conditions, the conditions in the Longshoremen's Union. The late 1940s won a Pulitzer Prize for them. The lid on the waterfront was blown sky high and the stage finally set for a showdown with the criminal empire of the New York docks. The docks will return here on the History Channel. We now return to the docks, trouble on the waterfront. The house of worship has long been a fixture on the waterfront, going back to Roman times when mariners prayed to the god Neptune for deliverance from the storm. And in the dark days of the late 1940s in New York Harbor, the Catholic Church was a place of refuge. Certain men with the turned around collar were fighting to expose waterfront corruption. It's a few Catholic priests, in particular a man named John Corridon, the so-called waterfront priest. He and his associates in a certain Jesuit institution that's interested in labor conditions on the dock are pursuing the matter. Father Corridan was the real-life inspiration for the character played by Carl Malden in On the Waterfront. Like Malden's Father Barry, the docks were Corridan's church. He was deeply committed to improving working conditions, even though longshoremen rarely trusted him. Then again, they rarely trusted anybody. But the priests had an advantage over other reformers. On the predominantly Catholic docks, they were immune from some forms of retribution. They're granted a certain leeway. They are not killed, for example, unlike Pete Panto. So Father Corridan and his associates in the Xavier Institute 
pursue matters. And so they're another part of the puzzle. They're gradually revealing conditions. By 1951, the revelations had reached a critical mass. The port had become an open scandal. And for the first time, politicians were forced to come to terms with the bad business on the docks. The governor of New York was Thomas E. Dewey, who had long ago earned fame by jailing racketeers. As it happens, Tom Dewey is still governor of New York, the old racket buster from the 30s who had wanted to do something about the waterfront when he was the boy racket buster in the 30s, couldn't do anything. Finally, the time was ripe for Dewey to do some racket busting on the waterfront. He appointed the New York State Crime Commission, which convened in 1951. He testified under oath that you were a leader of a gang of thugs. The highly publicized hearings in the smoke-filled courtrooms revealed how the union and the mob controlled the docks. Commissioners soon zeroed in on the longtime king of the New York waterfront, Joe Ryan. By now, Ryan had been president of the Longshore Union for a quarter of a century, hanging on to his job by strike-busting and by shameless red-baiting. And this is one of the reasons why Joe Ryan is left alone for so long. Uh, whenever he's brought up in front of Congress in, uh, you know, on some sort of subcommittee or something like that, he always brings up the communist issue. And he always labels the West Coast guys as being the Reds, dominated by bridges. Whilst in New York City, he says, these sort of people, we either crackheads or we run them off the docks. Before the Crime Commission, however, Ryan began to unravel. King Joe was grilled on his practice of hiring criminals fresh out of prison. At first, he repeated his old homily about giving the boys a second chance. But when really pushed uh, on this question about hiring ex-convicts, he basically pointed out that certain things had to be done on the waterfront, uh, certain forms of discipline. Sometimes rough things had to happen. The shipping companies don't particularly mind. They want a dock boss who will scare the minions, who will scare the guys into doing what the dock boss wants. Well, if that dock boss is someone who's done time for murder, the workers are gonna pay attention to him. Revelations of institutionalized thuggery on the docks were a breakthrough. In 1953, the state began screening workers for criminal backgrounds. Anybody with a record was fired from the docks. Joe Ryan now found himself in that dubious company. King Joe had been caught dipping into one of his own charities, an anti-Soviet fund he had overseen since the 1920s. Facing numerous indictments for embezzlement, Ryan was forced out. He was accused of misusing union funds and of doctoring books and various other small crimes, the least of his crimes, but those are the overt reasons that he is relieved of his duties. Next came the reform that longshoremen never dreamed they would see. New York abolished the shape-up, replacing it with a West Coast-style hiring hall. It's overdue, but finally hiring is done on a rotating basis that doesn't involve kickbacks. And so the men can now get work without having to fork over 10 or 20 or 30% of their wages. The goals of Pete Panto and Father Corridan had finally been realized. Joe Ryan was gone from the New York docks, as was his engine of exploitation, the shape up. The mob, however, remained, sending new soldiers down to the hiring hall as fast as the old ones were weeded out. But for rank-and-file longshoremen, the cycle of oppression had been broken. Pete Panto did not die in vain. His reforms took decades to finally get enacted, but they did get enacted. And we should honor his memory, the courage, uh, what he did in the face of known risks, uh, knowing that his life was in danger. Soon, however, the longshore era of Pete Panto, Joe Ryan, and the Anastasia brothers would be swept away. 
This time, the change would come in the innocuous form of a 40 by 8 foot aluminum box. The cargo container. The docks will return here on the History Channel. We now return to the docks, trouble on the waterfront. During World War II, the U.S. Navy developed a revolutionary method of shipping cargo. In a series of secret meetings beginning in 1953, the technology was introduced to private shipping companies. By the late 50s, what longshoremen called tin cans began appearing on the docks. Cargo containers, a new concept in ocean freight shipping. Containerization, the packaging of many separate items into a single unit to reduce handling and virtually eliminate cargo damage and pilferage. This was technology so simple, it's often compared to a child's toy, Legos. Containers are aluminum boxes of a standard size, usually 40 feet long by 8 feet wide. When stacked together, they interlock, virtually becoming a part of the ship. Then they're lowered onto semi-trailers and become part of the truck or rail car. But the ingenuity of containers had a dark side. They made longshoremen and their ancient craft obsolete. Cargo was no longer unloaded at the docks. It was merely transferred. Muscle and skill were replaced by giant container cranes. Still, the longshore unions controlled the waterfront and were calling the shots as to how and when containers would cross the docks. One thing was clear. There was no fighting the technological tide. We can't get into this guerrilla warfare with the ship owners because this progress is even more than the ship owners. It's just something that's a technological revolution that's coming and there's no way we can stop it. We have to get as much as we can out of it. The question remained, how big a payday would longshoremen extract for turning over the docks to the tin cans? At first, nobody knew the gigantic stakes involved, not the ship owners, and not even the old firebrand of the West Coast Longshore Union, Harry Bridges. The employer representative, J. Paul St. Sure, said to Bridges, all right, how about a million dollars for this pot to go to the longshoremen in compensation? And Bridges says, where did you come up with that number? And St. Sure said, well, it's a nice round number. <laughs> and Bridges came back the next day and said, a million and a half. And St. Sure said, where'd you come up with that number? And Bridges said, same place you came up with the million. At age 60, Bridges was still the darling of the left and the nemesis of the right. After a quarter century as union president, Bridges remained the picture of incorruptibility, 
he still made no more money than an ordinary longshoreman. Christ's sake, the salary was nothing. I mean, it's not like he's making millions. It wasn't like limousines and, you know, like chauffeurs and bodyguards and all that. Yeah, the guy's just down there, you know, having a cup of coffee with the rest of the guys. But even old-style solidarity was no match for technology. Beginning with the 1961 contract, Bridges and the other veterans of Bloody Thursday surrendered the docks to the containers. They'd won it in the 1930s. They sold it now in 1960, in a sense. The price tag was a hefty one guaranteed employment for all union members, lucrative retirement bonuses, veteran longshoremen were set for life. At the same time, however, it meant the death of the storied Embarcadero. Container shipping grew slowly at first on the West Coast, then came another war and it exploded. With escalating hostilities in Vietnam, came the need to transport ever-increasing tonnages of war material. The West Coast container industry boomed. Yet all those tin cans were being loaded out of Oakland, not San Francisco. The Embarcadero was too congested to handle the increase in traffic. The historic finger piers too small to accommodate the larger container vessels. The docks were abandoned and left to rot where they stood, and where they remain three decades later. On the East Coast, the container agreement was inked in 1966. It too included a bonanza for longshoremen called a Guaranteed Annual Income, or GAI. For generations of longshoremen who had been driven to borrow money from loan sharks, the new contract changed everything. The GAI came in and we were guaranteed a day's pay for every time that we showed up or we made ourselves available for work. The banks couldn't do anything but lay out a red carpet for us. Oh, you're a long show, how much do you want? But the victory was a hollow one. As part of the agreement, no new hires were allowed attrition began to take its toll. The longshore force dwindled to a skeleton crew. The ever-present mob also had a hand in the exodus from the harbor. As containers came in, they enforced their conditions. There was a point at which it was actually required that you unpack all the containers. And if you didn't, they'd virtually close you down. And if it got worse than that, they'd kill you. Going back to his days as a prosecutor specializing in organized crime, Mayor Giuliani has seen the mob chase business from the docks. You not only had the usual pressures of a labor union, but you had that backed by the violence that organized crime could bring about. People they would kill, the people they would threaten, the buildings they would burn. Eventually what happened was legitimate businesses, or even quasi-legitimate businesses, decided what they want to do business there for. It costs more money and our lives are in jeopardy. So let's go do business somewhere else. Somewhere else meant the sprawling new container ports like this one in Blackbeard's old haunt of Charleston, South Carolina. Along with the remapping of the harbors, containers have also changed the life of the sailor, and not always for the better. You used to go to sea to see the world. There's a beat about the worst way in the world to see the world now. You see a whole lot of white caps and seagulls. Since a container vessel can be unloaded in a matter of hours, gone are the days of the extended shore leave and many of the temptations of the waterfront. Now in the old days, you know, he'd have a night or two ashore, go up to some whorehouse, I mean, whatever the hell he did. Now down on the, once in a while down in the containers, you'll see a few ladies around what we call greeters. <laughs> <laughs> Along the way, some of the old docks have been rescued from their derelict state. In 1977, the first waterfront mall was opened on San Francisco's old Pier 39. It became a trend. Today, 
The old waterfront is mostly known for its wax museums and t-shirt shops. Where Ben Butler once looted the docks of New Orleans, there's a shopping mall called Riverwalk. At Chelsea Piers in New York, where the great liners once docked, there's an amateur hockey rink and driving range. Where San Francisco's longshoremen once fought her police, an even more incongruous sight. Harbor seals, in great numbers, have taken over a stretch of piers. And in Rome, runways of Da Vinci Airport have been built directly over the stone docks of the ancient port of Ostia. Yet the waterfront hasn't been completely sanitized. The proliferation of containers has meant new opportunities for smugglers. No customs force of any size could check the thousands of containers daily arriving at the docks. Nor has the underworld given up the ghost. There may have been reforms at union headquarters, but some locals remain in the mob's pocket. Today, the Genovese family and the Gambino family still run the docks in Manhattan and Brooklyn. 60 years now and counting, they've run the Brooklyn docks. As trade has bridged the oceans, the continents are now all but joined at the waterfront. What was set in motion on ancient Mediterranean docks has spread throughout the world. So has the organized crime and corruption that grew side by side with commerce. And the skeletons of the old wooden docks dance in the slow current. They are a sinister presence on the bland face of the modern harbor, commemorating a lawless past and the relentless power struggle that began in prehistory and continues to this day on the waterfront.